Hello, I'm VV Price of the New Mexico Mercury. I'm here today with Yvette Tovar, Executive Director of the New Mexico Water Collaborative. Really great to have you here, Yvette. Thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. In the early stages of what might be called a seriously protracted drought in New Mexico uh, and in the American West, let me start by asking you, uh, what is the New Mexico Water Collaborative? What are its, um, its mission? Uh, and who are its backers? The New Mexico Water Collaborative is a nonprofit organization whose mission is focused on working with the water crisis in New Mexico. So the premise is we are in a water crisis, first of all. Yeah. And what we do is we support the implementation of water conservation and water reclamation technologies for communities in the state, as well as we have an, an education component to our mission. So basically we're saying we're in a water crisis in New Mexico. There is something we can do about it and we try to focus on solutions. So what we focus on doing is supporting uh, conservation efforts, uh, looking at indoor water demand, right, as well as reclamation, water reuse opportunities, whether it's harvesting rainwater for reuse, uh, recycling gray water, and in some cases recycling black water or waste water. One of the questions that I've always been interested in is, is um, uh, can one apply uh, conservation and reclamation systems that are useful in small communities and even agricultural settings to large urban areas? I think when it comes to indoor water conservation opportunities, the difference between urban areas and more rural areas are actually minimal, right? Really? Yes, because you're, when you're looking at indoor water demand, you're looking at how much does a dishwasher, um, a toilet take to flush, uh, your washing machine, right? So conventional washing machines use between 40 to 50 gallons of water per load. When you look at the more efficient Energy Star machines of today, they're using 15 to 25 gallons. Mm. So that has application whether you're in a rural area, mm, right, sure. or in an urban setting, Absolutely. right? Some of the differences might occur, uh, say, in rural areas with agricultural applications where you have traditional flood irrigation methods and farmers starting to look at what are some subsurface irrigation opportunities right. where you can reduce the water demand without jeopardizing the economic yield of the crop, right? Just simply because there is not as much water in the acequias to support agriculture in the way that traditionally we're used to having happen. Wow. Well, that sort of brings up some very interesting topics, doesn't it? Yes. Uh, traditional use versus uh, contemporary uh, high-tech use, I guess you would have to call it. Is it... Um, what is the chief obstacle to, uh, to working with uh, traditional farmers, if I can call them that, uh, on water conservation technology? Is there an obstacle at all? I think there are some challenges, and I think we have some education um, that is needed on both the side of farmers and the general public. And a couple of those have to do with respecting what the traditional communities in New Mexico um, how they have viewed water, right, and the acequia culture and understanding how much it is a part of their cultural identity and the tradition of that, but balancing that with the environmental reality, which is that our rivers and our streams with reduced snow melt in the winter, with the longer drought season in the hotter months, are providing less and less water to sustain agricultural production, right? So those two are somewhat at odds with each other, yes, absolutely. you know, and how do you maintain respect for acequia culture, for traditional ways, but at the same time acknowledge the scarcity of water that we are dealing with today, and that does not seem to be so short-term and is becoming a longer and longer constant situation. So changing water technology costs money, right? Yes. Uh, when I talk to small farmers, um, say, in uh, the middle of Rio Grande Valley. And uh, we sort of ramble on a little bit about moving from alfalfa to organic farming and that kind of thing. Many of them say, well, that would be wonderful, but who has the money to change the equipment in order to do that in a way that becomes economically feasible? Do you think our, our current political leaders understand the necessity of incentivizing technological change water application. Right. I think there are two parts to that answer. And the first is that there's an additional question. Do our current political leaders recognize, first of all, that implementation is an avenue to a solution? I'm not sure that they do. 
I think that the water crisis and the water issue in general is really large. It's complicated. There are a lot of layers to it. And they haven't quite wrapped their heads around that completely, right? Some of some political leaders are much more knowledgeable about this issue than others, mm -hmm. and so that's part of that learning curve, right? right, right. Um, so, the, but the second part, back to the incentive, is that no, until you recognize or acknowledge that implementation and conservation are actually an avenue to a solution, then it's hard to make the leap to understanding how one promotes that by incentivizing that, right? right? right. Because you're absolutely right. For a farmer who is land rich and has water rights, but is cash poor, right, and does not have the money for capital implementation, they may totally understand that that conversion would be wonderful for their farm, but if they're not able to finance that, then it's at a dead end. So if it's difficult to get people to incentivize rural technological change in water delivery. What about the getting um, urban leaders to do the same thing on a massive urban scale, um, where it's not just one farm and, and uh, where it's the half a million houses? It right. uh, right. seems to me to be an enormous problem. So currently within the Albuquerque Bernalillo area, Indoor water conservation technologies and implementations are incentivized, right? The Water right, Utility yes, yes. Authority is offering rebates for changing out of uh, washing machines to higher efficiency machines that are using less water, to toilets, right, that are using 1.28 gallons per flush versus the higher, and you can get quite a bit of rebate on each of those, right? right? right. Um, so those exist. I think the next step, though, is about incentivizing reclamation, water reuse opportunities, yes, right? Yes. So the Water Utility Authority is about to roll out a new conservation plan. They've been gathering data and having uh, community meetings for the last several months, right? And they're coming out with new initiatives about ways to conserve and reuse water, right? Um, so in my opinion, one of the greatest things they're coming out with was the idea of really trying to promote rainwater harvesting Really, for storage in a cistern, Good. right, um, and incentivizing that for homeowners, right, and so um, obviously that'd be helpful for business owners too, but Absolutely. when you really look at the increased water demand that is happening in urban areas, there's a huge opportunity for one, reducing still the amount of fresh water that a home needs to function, yeah. but then the idea of using water more than once, right, before it needs to go back to where it needs to get to um, is really important and so providing incentives to increase those opportunities and increase awareness in the general public about how viable that actually is is an important step. Boy it sure is. So I, I'd really like for you to explain what um, water reclamation technologies exist that can be applied on a large urban scale. Um, so it's a short list of reclamation technologies, but they're incredibly effective when they're implemented, right? So one would be capturing rainwater to be reused. Right. It can be reused for landscape application. It can be reused to flush a toilet uh, interior. It can be reused uh, to help the function of a swamp cooler. Oh, right. Of course. So there are there are several ways in, in which you can reuse that water, right? In Bernalillo County, about 60-65% of water bills in homes is used in the application of landscape support, right? 60%. 60 to 65%. Wow. So a lot of our water bill is used for supporting plant material outside of the house. Right. Right. About another quarter of that is used for laundry, right? So those are, that's one way to reuse water. Right. The other way is to recycle gray water, right? right? So gray water is recycling the indoor water that comes to your bathroom, your bathroom sink, your bathtub, and your laundry water, okay? So there's an opportunity to reuse that. Right. And you can store that also in a cistern, and oh. it can be reused in the landscape to support plant material, or like I said, for a swamp cooler application. But that, those are pretty much it. You could also, in new construction, though, recycle it back into the system so that it's being used to flush toilets. So one of the things I think people don't really understand is that we're using drinking water to flush our toilets. Yeah, I know. It's a terrible Right? Yeah. So it's really quite amazing when you think about that, that we have a shortage of water, but that we're using f fresh water right. to do that. And 
not only are we pumping that fresh water to flush our toilets, but there's an energy component to that. Right, and so we're requiring a fair amount of energy to get that water to all of our homes, t so that the system can function. So I understand that um, that household incentivizing of water reclamation, to water conservation, uh, has has been very successful. We've done it too, of course, and we never do anything without having a jug underneath our sink. So every time we're trying to get hot water or anything, we're always using that water, and we're always using it in the house. You know? Uh, to water plants and everything, and I'm sure many people do. But when you're talking about water reclamation technology, you're talking about retrofitting or uh, uh, building afresh a whole alternative water system in a house, right? That, uh, you can't mix gray water and clean water because that correct that, that defeats the, uh, the purpose. So, um, what are the are the uh, how do you incentivize retrofitting a house? Let's say, I mean, like our house here. And uh, what is the added cost, you think, of adding a whole grace, uh, a, a self-contained gray water system in a new house? So when looking at new construction, that's obviously the easiest way to implement a reclamation system. Absolutely. Right? So you're, you're right. You're doing a redundant system within new construction, and that's just the most straightforward way to to have the plumbing in there, separating out your black water from your gray water, having them each go where they need to go yes. and function quite well and, right. and recycle that water. It is more difficult and challenging in a lot of ways to retrofit existing homes. Yeah. It can really range uh, the costs for that implementation. And some of the factors that affect that would be everything from, uh, let's say we're going to capture rainwater off from your ro roof. How big an area are we going to capture it from? How much square footage, right? right. If you're thinking that it's about a dollar uh, a square foot, you know, a dollar a gallon, really, to store that water, and you're talking about capturing from an 800 square foot roof, that's one thing. If you have a 4,000 square foot house, that's a whole other story, right? right? Uh, it's the difference between the, whether you have a flat roofed house and a pitched roof house. Right. It's about conveyance, right? What are, what's the most logical way to capture that water? Is there room around your house to actually house or position a cistern above uh, earth or does right. it need to be buried, yeah, right, right? right? So those are the things. Um, the construction of a house, whether you have a basement, whether your house is on a concrete slab, Right, whether your house is made out of adobe, which is kind of tough when you're trying to get plumbing through yeah, an adobe well, wall, yeah, or whether you have frame construction, or whether you have CMU block construction. Those are all the variables that affect the ability of getting at the source of where water is being used and tapping into that as it's coming out of the house. Right. Right. So um, it can range from a couple of thousand dollars to many thousands of dollars, sure. depending yeah. on how, how much, what's the volume. So for example, if you have three bathrooms in your house, it may not be optimum condition to harvest the water from all three bathrooms, right? Depending on where they're located within the footprint, oh, yeah. right? So you might look at, well, where is the laundry room in proximity to some of those restrooms? Yeah. And if you want to harvest the gray water, what's the best way to synthesize those opportunities? And it could be that one bathroom, which is over way by the master bath our bedroom, excuse me, yeah. is really not the optimal location to harvest because really we're using these bathrooms right. a little bit more anyway, right? right the kids right, are taking yeah. their baths and yeah. their showers yeah. over yeah. here, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Or if you are two people in a house and you have three bathrooms, but really two of them are only used when guests come in, that may not be yeah. the area that you want to tap into the plumbing, right. right? So there needs to be an efficiency in terms of how you approach it. Every house is a little bit different. You want to know how much gray water is actually being generated in that house, how much black water is being generated in that house, right? Uh, what are the opportunities for capturing roof runoff water? You know, it may be that if the house is generally sloping to one side, that's a fabulous opportunity yeah, to right. capture that, right? right, right. Um, but in a lot of houses today, especially sloped, uh, pitched roof houses, there is no conveyance. There is no gutter system, right? right? A lot of contractors today don't build that. You know, when it rains, the water just sheets off the side of the house. So there, are, but there's opportunities, yeah, right? Very, very and nice. so that even if it's not a mechanical opportunity, those are opportunities for passive rainwater harvesting also, which means as that water comes off of the roof, you direct that in such a way with swales, depressions in the in the landscape, right, to maximize that water, to direct it to where you want to go, so that it's of maximum benefit to plant material. All of this, um, 
sounds pretty daunting. Uh, big tasks, big job, big money. But the fact of the matter is, if we are, and I think we are, and I know you think we are, in the, in the, at the beginnings of a, of a weather cycle that will have drought as the standard, uh, and that where literally, virtually every drop of water will become important. The complications involved, I mean, they are, after all, pipes. They're not computers, necessarily. Um, can be solved. I mean, this is not an unsolvable problem, nor is it an overwhelmingly expensive problem. It is expensive, but if if governments take the responsibility to incentivize it, it's perfectly possible to do. The question: Am I right about that? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. So, what? Um, I guess the basic question is: Is uh, if you have to do it, and we do have to do it, I think. Uh, what does it take from government to get it started? I would say in some respects, government does get it. So, and what I mean by that is in December of last year, the Bureau of Reclamation released a Colorado Basin, Colorado Basin Study Report, which was right. a three-year study looking at the Colorado Basin, which is the larger watershed in which we belong, right? And looking what the water supply was like versus the water demand that we're facing right. in these western states. Right. At the end of that report, they also looked at what are the recommendations? What can we do? And they looked at all the different technological choices and opportunities. What they came up with and what the recommendation was at the end was that the most economic, in terms of efficiencies, the most immediate implementation and the most immediate impact on our environment and on our water supply were water conservation and reclamation right. technologies, right. right? So it wasn't about desalination and it wasn't about, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. huge engineering feats to affect the crisis that we're in, okay? So that's saying that on some level, the federal government yes. is understanding that this is what's needed, yeah. right? So the next steps are for then state and local municipalities right. to look at that study, digest that, and say, okay, so what can we do? What part are we responsible for, right? In the Albuquerque area, we're responsible for a pretty good chunk because this is where the densest population yeah, is in absolutely. the state. So what does that mean? It's a wonderful opportunity to affect change, absolutely. right? So the New Mexico Water Collaborative, one of our guiding principles is that we can affect change. We have to meet people where they're at, right? There's an education component to that. Right. Right? And understanding that there are some folks that completely understand that 3,000 square feet of high water turf grass in their front yard is not a regionally appropriate use of water. Right. But then there are other folks who think that as long as I turn on my faucet and water is coming out, how bad is it? Yeah. It's really okay. right? So we, like I said, we have to meet them where they're at and help them understand that the incentives that we're asking government to provide are really in the best interest of all of us. And that even as individuals, when we hear about this water crisis, it's overwhelming. We are overwhelmed as everyday people thinking there's an energy crisis, there's a water crisis, you know, we have all of these environmental issues. How can I, as a person just going about my life, actually affect change? But I can, because I think if we sit around and wait for a silver bullet to come and make everything okay, that's not going to happen. Right, right. But we can start working at this and chipping away by what each of us do within our own dwellings, within our businesses, within our larger communities. So given that the state legislature this year did not pass a water bill of any sort, uh, and given your optimism, which I think is not at all misplaced, um, what are the kinds of questions that a politician needs to be able to answer to a constituency which is always overwhelmingly concerned about taxation. So when you're a policymaker who's responsible to, for reporting to your constituents the choices that you make in their best interests, right? And there are so many topics that are of urgent need, especially in these last few years with economic hardship as they've been, you really need to have an understanding of water. There right. is a, right, and water law in New Mexico, water application, it is a very complicated topic, right? Um, and they have to, you have to take the time to learn about that. 
Absolutely. Now, I've yeah, there are lawmakers within the state, depending on where they're at in the state, who have more critical issues with water coming up, and they've they've educated themselves. And you can tell when you hear them speak about it that they have a good understanding. Everybody understands that there's a water crisis. Do they all understand what to do about it, or what direction, or can even agree about what changes are needed? No, no, I don't think so. No. Right? But is it incumbent upon them to figure it out? Absolutely. 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 But I also think, coupled with that, we cannot rely on policymakers alone to solve the water crisis. We are in this as a community, right? So we're there, we're talking as a municipality, as a state, as a watershed. We share in the scarcity of this critical natural resource, right? right? So asking the government to solve the whole problem about it, I think is not fair. We all have to take responsibility for our portion. What kind of uh, percentage of savings do we get out of, out of these conservation and reclamation techniques? Is it a big amount or is it a small amount? I think it's big and it has the potential to be quite huge. Good. So for example, if you are converting a high water turf grass with spray irrigation and you're converting to a xeric or a more uh, regionally appropriate plant palette and plant design with drip irrigation, you're looking at something around a 60 to 70 percent reduction in water demand. No kidding. Yeah. Wow. It's huge. If you if you have a t uh, an older toilet in your house that is using between three to six gallons of water per flush and the new low is 1.28 gallons, that's like an 80 percent reduction. Gosh. Right? That's impressive. Right. right. Yeah, really. That's huge. Right. If you have a washer that uses 40 to 50 gallons of water, the older top-loaded washers, and now you're using 15 to 25. Again, that's a minimum 50 to 75 percent savings, depending on the cycle you choose. That's an, those are very simple measures that have an immediate and direct impact on the amount of fresh water that is pumped and needed to sustain a household. I bet I know that you're a mom, and I'm a grandpa, and while it's sometimes um, easy to become depressed uh, and even to get pessimistic. In our places, we can't afford to do that. Uh, the future of the world is in the hands of our children. Uh, things may not be optimistic, but they're certainly hopeful. Uh, but what you just, just uh, said about the actual physical realities of reclamation and conservation is enormously hopeful if you get people to do it. So I guess what I want to ask you now, just to wrap things up, is is uh, what do you see as the picture of the future? Not necessarily an idealized future, but what can we expect if things go sort of the right way? I think what we can expect is that the children of today, the six-year-olds, the 10-year-olds, the 15-year-olds, in 5, 10, 15, 20 years are going to grow up and water conservation and reclamation will be second nature to them. Excellent. I sure right? Right. Yeah. yeah, they will automatically know that five minute showers are what they need to do. Yeah. They will be respectful of the rainwater when it comes. They will understand that wasting water and being irresponsible with it is not an option. You know, that's just wonderful. And you know, you've really managed to fill me with optimism today, and I, and I need that, uh, and I know all of us do. Thank you so much for being here. It's been a joy to have you at, at you. the New Mexico Mercury. Thank you so much for the opportunity to come and chat with you about this. I really appreciate it. It's an important topic, and it's good to help people understand what the possibilities are and that there is optimism. Good.